Um, I just want to welcome you to the Whalen Library via Zoom. <laughs> Tonight, we are excited to have Dr. Kwan Q. Lai here to share her latest memoir, The Girl Who Taught Herself to Fly. Dr. Lai is originally from Penang, Malaysia, and she received a full scholarship from Wellesley College. She is a Harvard Medical Faculty Physician. In 2005, she left academia to dedicate time to humanitarian work in HIV AIDS at the, in the Ebola, and the Ebola Af outbreak in Africa for the Syrian Rohingya refugee crisis and during the COVID-19 pandemic in both New York and at the Navajo Nation. In addition to her book that we'll talk about tonight, she's the author of Lest We Forget, A Doctor's Experience with Life and Death During the Ebola Outbreak and Into Africa, Out of Academia, A Doctor's Memoir. Thank you so much to Dr. Lai for being here tonight. Just a couple quick notes. Um, we're recording this session for our the library's YouTube page and for broadcast on our local cable access station. So you'll be able to rewatch and share. And um, Dr. Lai will speak for about 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions. So feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time, and we will be sure to get to them when we get to the Q&A. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Lai. Well, thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, thank you for arranging this to and fro uh, meeting. And uh, I'd like also to thank the couple of people who signed up in person, which is kind of something that author looks forward to, to meet the readers in person. So I'm sorry that this has come down to a Zoom meeting. So I, my heartfelt thanks for those two people who are really uh, sign up to to meet the author and also i like to put a couple of words to uh, the silver unicorn bookstore your local bookstore who agreed to sell books and unfortunately because it's not a live meeting any in-person meeting anymore they do have some of my books so if you want to support an independent bookstore that will be a great place to go to buy my books all right, so what I want to do is uh, to first read a couple of pages from my book, and then I can show you some slides uh, about Penang and about the way I grew up. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go to the first chapter. Chapter one, oh, to be able to fly. My life changed when Ayi, my mother, enrolled me into primary school. I was a fledgling, slowly growing her feathers and preparing her wings for a long flight into self-determination and independence. Before then, I watched with envy as droves of Tamil girls went to the school across from my home to learn to read and write. They wore clean blue and white uniforms, carrying the school books in their shoulder bags while I was the street urchin who remained uneducated, whiling away my time, conceiving ways to play pranks on them. On our way home from Kuoming Chinese Primary School, my second sister, Kwan Mei, who was two years older than me, occasionally took a shortcut through the Tamil Indian village. The Tamils lived in mud houses next to a few open stalls where they kept their cattle and goats. The ground was always wet with cow dung and urine. And on rainy days, rivulets of animal waste filled with the paths. We picked our way with great care around the puddles, trying to keep our white shoes white. The overwhelming stench defeated our efforts of covering our noses with our handkerchiefs. The Indians' homes were made of mud mixed with straw and cow dung. The women drew kolam early in the morning after sweeping a patch of dirt at the front door of their homes and dousing it with water. They sprinkled finely ground rice flour freehand and with little hesitation created symmetric and geometric designs of vines and flowers. The kolam was a sign of invitation to welcome all into their home, including Rishmir the goddess of prosperity and wealth, and it prevented evil spirits from entering. 
A little Indian girl cared for her baby brothers playing on a small patch of concrete floor at the back of their house, surrounded by dirt, dung, and mud. The Indian girl's dress, brown with dirt, was missing a shoulder strap. It draped across the chest, barely covering her nipple. No sunlight penetrated the thick, waxy foliage of a mango tree. A corner of the world was dark and dingy. She flashed a shy smile when we ran by. A woman, hair done up in a bun, hunched over a stove with blinding and choking fumes rising from the fire she had started with dried cow dung and coconut husks, yelled at the girl to fetch a pot from the house. Hidden in the forsaken corner of the earth, the government was not likely to discover a lone girl whose parents broke the law for not sending her children to the, <clears throat> to the mandatory primary school. One day, when we took the, that shortcut, Kwame and I stopped in our tracks. The Indian girl was dressed in bright silk, while her brothers remained in tatters. Her face was powder white, her eyes were outlined in black hole, and her fingers were stained with henna. A colorful and glittery scarf draped over her head, and numerous gold bangles dangled from her wrists. Her feet remained bare, except for encircling golden anklets and toe rings, and her nails were painted bright red. Her resplendence contrasted with the dark, squalid ambience of the back of the mud house. Despite the stench, we stood transfixed, admiring her transformed appearance, unsure why she was so richly attired. The red bindi on her forehead gave her away. And at 13, although she looked more like 10, she had become a married woman. By a cement tank outside the house, a grown Indian man splashed and poured a bucket of water over his curly dark hair, taking his bucket bath. He had hair growing from his chest all the way down below the navel. Apart from a dirty loincloth, he was naked. We averted our eyes and ran past him. Was this grown man twice her size, her husband? He could have been her father. Did he live in the same village and own many head of cattle? A good marriage for her, according to the Indian tradition. Soon the little Indian girl's belly began to swell. Less than a year after she was married, she cradled her baby while still caring for her younger brothers. All while Kwame and I continued running back and forth from school to home. Her world remained the same patch of concrete floor surrounded by the cow stalls and stench. Her baby in a pack on her back while she prepared the family meals. A frightening thought crossed my mind. What if my father decided to marry us all the same way? I shuddered. Are ye my mother? certainly could not prevent this from happening. She could not stop him from giving her baby, a one, away to his brother. Even before the baby was weaned, she was not even included in the discussion and had no say whatsoever. I wanted to see the world and not be bound to a small forgotten fragment of the earth. I wanted to be free from the island traditional marriage role for women. I thought hard for days for a solution and concluded that if this was going to happen to me, I would run away. But where and how? Looming, troubling questions requiring urgent answers, and I had none. From that day on, I worked doubly hard at school. Somehow my wrecked brain told me that to get out of a world where girls had almost no control of their future, I had to excel in my education. I had to dig myself out. Many women of my mother's generation married through arranged marriages. The parents of my peers, especially those from the low income group, took them out of school to help raise younger siblings and earn money, eventually marrying them off. Like my mother, they were soon burdened with children. They lived with their parents-in-law and helped with chores under the stern rule of their mothers-in-law. We counted ourselves lucky my father had not forced us to drop out of school 
to help him full time in his food stall. If he ever did, I hope Awi, my adopted brother, would intervene. By that time, he was working full time and helping with the family expenses. He carried a certain amount of financial clout to sway my father's decision. My mother was a very fertile woman. She was in a perpetual state of pregnancy, breastfeeding or cradling a baby. No sooner had a baby been weaned from her breast than she was pregnant again. Sometimes she became pregnant even before the baby was weaned. She never had time to recover from her previous pregnancy and remained then, always nurturing life in and out of her womb, having hardly any surplus to fuel her fat reserves. With the first batch of babies, my father arranged for help around the house for a month so she could devote her attention to the baby and recover from childbirth. As time went on, he stopped getting her the extra help. He pitched in and helped with the household chores. She ate special rice fried in sesame oil and ginger and drank the red postpartum wine, but they no, no longer lasted for an entire month. One evening, as was typical, my father sat at the dinner table chewing his food, savoring the tiger beer from a big mug foam forming a moustache on his upper lip. Tapping his chopsticks impatiently on the side of a bowl, he grumbled as the specters of his discontent happened to pass through the kitchen. In Hokkien, he said, Galea Buyong, useless lads. Although my father was Hakka, he spoke to us in the Hokkien dialect of Penang Island, the Chinese dialect of most of the islanders the so-called Nanyang or the South Seas Chinese. The Hakka Chinese are largely descended from the North Han Chinese in the northern provinces of China and migrated and settled in Southern China. In the 19th century, many Hakka and Nanyang Chinese, including my father's parents, migrated to Malaya. Ayi was Tochiu, but she spoke Hakka and Hokkien. My father considered us girls Ayi's children and he had nothing to do with us. Whenever we did anything wrong, he said to her, Lue Jabokian, these are your daughters. It had been several years since my mother first gave birth to a baby boy, a Jabokian, my brother Boon. He desperately wanted another. Throwing down his chopsticks on the table, he pushed his chair back and got up with a loud groan. He had lost his appetite after such an unappetizing monologue. Ayi seldom did ever offer her opinion. He said to her, Zhu Kam Kim, literally holding gold in one's mouth, afraid to lose it if one opens one's mouth to speak, referring to Ayi's silence. Wobbling to the front porch, he took out his folding reclining chair, slowly lowered himself into it, lit his pipe and began puffing. The drink both took effect and soon he began to snore. While Ah Yi never argued with him when he blamed her for birthing the girls, my older sister Fong, his firstborn, was not so reticent. Her nursing school education taught her the sex of a baby was a contribution from both parents. The argument often got heated, but through it all, Ah Yi remained hesitant. Finally, the heavens must have heard my father's prayer, for whenever he could, he went to the temples to burn joysticks and incense, praying to the gods to bless him with another boy. Ayi's eighth baby was a Tabokia, my brother Bing, born when I was eight years old. Happy at last, he celebrated the occasion with a bottle of Guinness stout, while it was my brother Awi who bought a bottle of postpartum red wine for Ayi. My father bragged about his tapokia to all his friends. <clears throat> when Ayi became pregnant for the ninth time, she consulted a neighbor, Fat Chu, who loaned her money during hard times, wanting to know how to get rid of it. Snapping green beans at the kitchen table, she said to Ayi, Jiang Lai, eat pineapples. 
Apparently, she believed that eating anything sour would cause the womb to contract and push the baby out. In a fruit orchard, a few anemic pineapple bushes grew under the dense shade of the rambutan trees, but they failed to produce any fruits. Ayi had to spend what little she had to buy them from the market. One day, waves of abdominal cramps overcame her. She lay on the floor next to my father's cot, groaning. Thick, dark, slimy fluid oozed between her legs and through her sarong. She asked Kwame to hurry and fetch Fat Chu. Fat Chu came running in, her wooden clogs, her bosom heaved and bounced below her sarong. Ay yo, Lue Si, you want to die? She washed Ayi and tucked her in bed while I prayed to God to spare her life. Ayi rested in bed for a few days, then got up and wobbled to the kitchen to resume being a mother again. She had lost that baby, but a few months passed and the belly grew big again. Alas, it was another Jabokian, a girl. Upset, my father stayed away from home, too late, returning drunk. Skipping dinner, he changed into his sarong, went straight to bed, and never once took a look at the baby. Ayi did not try to get rid of her subsequent pregnancies after that scary attempt. It, in my early teens, I made up my mind that my that to sum, not to submit myself to living a life like Ayi, completely financially dependent on my father. Although given the choice and the right circumstances, she would have loved to find herself a job and be rid of her dependency. Her lack of education hampered her and she was overburdened with too many children. She tried hard to be financially independent by raising her brood of fowls, but that was fraught with uncertainty. I remember the little Indian girl living on a small fragment, forgotten patch of the earth. The solution for me to escape the cycle of poverty was to get a good education a career and not be financially dependent on a man. Even if I did get married, I would have to say what I could and could not do. When I was six, living in the orchard with the wang fields in the back of the house, I watched the swallows or the burong layang layang flying excitedly in the evening, swooping fast and low with their tuxedo scissor-like tails, temptingly close to me, teasing and challenging me to follow their lead. It was then I asked us what we imagined ourselves to be if we could change into an animal. I told her without hesitation, I wish I could fly as free as a swallow. This thought stayed with me and it spurred me to pursue a drastic course to leave my loved ones, my home and my country to fulfill my dreams. I fell in love with the idea of being free, independent and the one to steer my own destiny. I wanted to be like the swallow, the burang layang layang. I wanted to be able to fly. I never asked Ayi what she wished to be. Did she also dream about being free to choose and oh, to be able to fly? All right, I'm going to share some uh, slides with you. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how to get to the share screen. 
should be at the bottom in the center. Of the yeah, agenda. share screen. But yeah. I can't find my PowerPoints. Is oh. there any way I can find is it? it? Is it already open somewhere? It is open, yeah. Hmm. Um, it won't be showing like the open slides. It'll show sort of the workspace of the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have to say present slides. I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. Let me see. If I say share screen, mm -hmm. and I have my PowerPoint open. You don't see it? No, I think the next thing after share screen is to select that window. Uh, uh, what window? So when you hit share screen, it will ask you what window do you want to share? Um, and then you choose PowerPoint. Ooh, it doesn't give me that. It's possible it's hiding behind another window. If you minimize Zoom, maybe. You could also if we can't figure it out, you could send me the slides and I can share them and you can talk through them. Okay. Uh, no, so uh, share screen. Yep. Okay. And then it gives me this box of Dropbox and everything, but it doesn't give me the PowerPoint. It's not giving you a picture of the yeah. PowerPoint. Oh no. Hmm. Doesn't give me that either. Hmm. Sorry about that. Okay. Ah, here. Yeah. Maybe this is it. Are you seeing it? Yes. We are. We are. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so this book that I wrote is uh, about my life growing up in Penang, Malaysia, before I came to Wellesley College. And uh, so let me just see what I can advance this. This is the cover of the book. And uh, I was uh, <clears throat> born in Penang, which is uh, on the on the coast of the Malin Peninsula. And this is a little star showing the island, uh, which is the next slide will show you that is the island uh, on, the, uh, on the western part of the coast of Malayan Peninsula. It's very close to Thailand. And this is a blow up picture of the, uh, of the island, which when I was growing up, I, I think it looks like a turtle. Um, Georgetown is the city that I was born in, uh, in the north uh, east corner of the island. It's a very tiny island. And this is a picture that I got from the 50s and 60s when I was growing up of the main road, the Penang Road, uh, that is now a one way street. And you have a lot of rickshaws. And because we were under the English from 1786 to 1975, almost 200 years, uh, Queen Victoria was the queen then, and she had her diamond jubilee, and the islanders built a clock tower to commemorate her diamond jubilee. And we were under the British uh, for all close to 200 years, and colonialism, uh, brings about bad and good things. And one of the good things that colonialism brought to the island was a good system of education. And the earliest school that was built uh, in the early 19th century is uh, Penang Free School. And that was built for boys only. And this is still one of the oldest schools in Southeast Asia, and it's a pretty well-known school. So there was no schools for girls until the late 19th century. Uh, when a uh, wife of a uh, Anglican minister decided to uh, to have a school in her home, but that was started with uh, well-to-do families. Until late in the nineteenth century, she just decided to build a school that was uh, open to girls of different social classes. 
And that was one of the school that I went to in my late secondary school years. <clears throat> when I was growing up in Penang, as I was reading from the book, that girls were not favored uh, over boys because boys could carry on with the family name. And girls, would, after they are married, they take on the husband's name. So the, the family name, our family name will disappear. So we'll end with the, with the girls. So my father always favored uh, boys over girls. <clears throat> so when the, uh, the missionaries came with the English, they started building lots of other schools. The Jesuits built uh, St. Xavier's Boys School and the Methodists built schools for both boys and girls. And the Catholic nuns built lots of convent schools on the island and those schools were for girls. So there's a lot of competition between boys and girls in the, in the education. And uh, not to be outdone, the local people, a uh, big racial group of Malays, Indians, and Chinese. The Chinese are very into education, so they built uh, schools for uh, a Chinese school. And this is a secondary uh, well-known Chinese school that was built by the Chinese. And the <clears throat> Buddhist nuns in Penang built a school for girls. And that's the school that my older sister, after she left the convent school, went to. So girls during my time um, were not sent to schools after, after primary school, which is a mandatory part of the schooling. And they were often uh, taken out of school and then farm up to, to earn a living uh, or to get ready to get married. Um, for well-to-do families, they usually the parents would push for higher education. Uh, if they were quite rich, they would send their children abroad to Australia, which is the closest country uh, to go to school. Or if they were quite rich, they could send their children to England to go to school. And India is especially uh, quite um, popular, especially for medical school. When I was growing up, um, there were very few books in my family. And we, um, as you can see that you have very good library in the US. And on the island, uh, we had two, two places where you could borrow books. Uh, one is the British uh, Penang Library, where you had to pay a big fee to be a member, and I couldn't afford that. But then fortuitously, my secondary school teacher took us to a field trip to this place uh, in the India House, where United States Information Service set up a big library, kind of information service for the island. And uh, you could say propaganda, maybe to spread the goodwill of America. But the nice thing is that when after we visited that, that house, we were given a free library card. Uh, we Each of us could borrow two books every two weeks. And so that was a, a huge uh, step up for me to be able to go to a library to borrow books. I started reading quite a bit. And also around that time, I was in secondary school then, my, my sister's friend came back from US he was from a rich family, so he went to school on his own uh, uh, family support. And he told my sister that you have a smart sister and she wanted to go to school. She should look into going to US um, colleges and universities, which would offer her a scholarship. So that piece of information drove me to this uh, United States Information Service, where I spent many, many months uh, doing research and how to apply for colleges and universities in uh, America. <clears throat> so it was, um, I'm missing something here. I'm just going to go back to this slide here. I was just talking about Malaya, which later became Malaysia in 1963 when Singapore joined us as one of the country, but later they separated from us. Malaya or Malaysia is a multiracial country. We have majority Malays in 67%. Uh, 
Chinese made up 25% of the population, and Indian, uh, who are mainly Southern Indians from the Indian continent, 7%. Uh, they were the people that were brought over by the British to be coolies in the ports, as well as in the rubber plantation and tin mines. The actual native uh, Malaysians are really less than 1%. They are called the Orang Asli, they are the native uh, Malaysians. So all of us are immigrants, and so these are the original uh, people in the, on the island. In the 60s, after independence, parliament decided to coin a Sanskrit word called Bumiputra. And that word uh, designates that Malays are called Bumiputra, and Malays, the majority, are also people who speak Malay and who practice Islam. And these people are given special privileges in uh, education, business, and they also are promote, well, promoted to, to go to school and to be given scholarships over and above other racial groups. Because of the special treatment, um, a lot of us who were in the minorities were not able to compete with the Malays. So that was one of the reasons why I have to look elsewhere to, uh, to go to school. So after many months of research, I got a, an acceptance letter from Wellesley College, um, and, and they gave me a full scholarship of $3,440 to be awarded to me yearly, which was a, a, a gold mine for me. So whereas United States Information Service introduced me to the wide, wider world, Wealthy College gave me the opportunity to advance my education. So I'm going back to look at the United States population studies a few years ago. They found out that greater than 50% of the world population is less than 24 years of age. And there are still about 142 million child marriages. So to, to many, many uh, girl children who are were married uh, in a young age and burdened with children, they know, uh, many of them do not have the opportunity to go to school. So they remain in poverty and uh, in a power imbalance between the, the husband and wives. And if you recall many years ago, Melela was uh, shot in the head by the Taliban for championing that girls should be able to go to school. And even right now, the Taliban in Afghanistan, after almost two years of uh, takeover of Afghanistan, the girls and women are still not allowed to go to school, so are banned from uh, furthering their education, which compared to my situation, my situation is because I was poor, but I didn't have a government who stopped me from uh, going to school. The government did not support me with scholarship, but the government did not stop girls from going to school. So the October 11 is International Day of the Girl Ch Child. It's a global observance declared by the United Nations to promote girls empowerment and the fulfillment of the human rights. So even now, there are many areas in the world that girls are still in, like in the Middle Ages, uh, not able to advance their, their uh, cause. I have uh, left academia sometimes 16 years ago and started doing humanitarian work uh, off and on, uh, besides doing my clinical work. And I did get myself involved in the greatest Ebola outbreak in uh, West Africa and uh, wrote a book about it, uh, about the Ebola outbreak and my experiences there. And uh, it is a very easy book to read, it's not technical. And I also spent uh, from 19, from uh, 20, 2006 to about 2013, off and on, I spent time in Africa doing various work, uh, especially in HIV AIDS uh, education, uh, working in famine situation, in the refugee situation. And there I collected all my stories and experiences and wrote a book about Into Africa Out of Academia, a doctor's memoir, 
uh, that is all about my experiences in Africa, um, minus the Ebola experience. So those are the two books that I wrote, and this is the third one that can just chronicle my uh, my journey to America to have an education. So that's all I am going to say about the, my uh, my books. And so if you would like to answer uh, ask questions, I'd be happy to uh, to answer them. I was just wanted to show you a few uh, indulgence uh, slides. This is my uh, last month. I went to hike to uh, Everest Base Camp, and this is my second or third day of hiking. And you see, this is Everest. You can see the tip of Everest just with the clouds behind it. And this is the um, Sherpa that took Hillary uh, to the top of Everest. Tenzin Norgay, and his uh, statue was in the national park there. And uh, here I was, uh, it was a snowy day and we were hiking the third or second day, I forgot. And this is me pointing to Hillary Suspension Bridge, which we have to, to climb up to cross. Uh, and uh, that's my guide and my porter. And this is the yak that carry many, many, many heavy stuff. Uh, we will encounter them on a hike. Uh, this is part of a hiking towards base camp. Again, lots of heights, and that's a spectacular view of uh, Everest, the Himalayas mountain. And you could see base camp right there. And uh, my goal was to get there. So it was a very long slog. And here I am approaching it, and this is all the routes. I uh, uh, was told by the guide that was strewn around by the glacier. And you finally reached base camp after eight days of climbing. And then after that, another four days of uh, trekking down to uh, Dukla to go home. That was my adventure last week, I mean last month. So I would just um, share my slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lars. Fascinating. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what inspired you to write this book and your two previous books. What sort of uh, kicked them off for you yeah, different actually, points in your life? Actually, this uh, third book is my the first book that I wrote. I wrote them when I started uh, going to Africa. And my first country in Africa was Uganda. And that's why I, you know, my hiking thing was I went to hike the uh, Kilimanjaro. My, the first thing I did uh, it was my hiking uh, experience to the highest place in, uh, in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I found that when I was in Uganda, uh, night fell very quickly uh, in the tropics and everything was plunged into the darkness. There was nothing much to do, no Wi-Fi, no TV, just a naked light bulb to read. And even then was not enough light for me to read, I have to use my headlamp. I decided I have so many hours of being alone that I would write and, uh, and not to get published, but just to write my thing about my growing up. I'm thinking that my children will read them. Uh, so they will have some notions of what it was like to to live in a, a, a poor area. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's just writing lots of stuff, you know, just information for them. But in the end, I got uh, interfered with other experiences that Ebola came along. I decided that I was interviewed by NPR and they, they one of the reporters said I should write a book about it. And I said, I thought about it. So that's how I kept a blog and I used a blog and I wrote a book about Ebola, so that became my first book. And I was very deeply involved in humanitarian work and uh, my African experiences really moved me and I decided that I should also write about my African experiences and that's how the second book came. My third book was sitting in the back burner and I thought that I should resurrect it somehow and I, and looking at all the information I had, I kind of reduced them 
to the, the parts that I think will be important for people to read uh, so that it could be something that is publishable. So I, I left out lots of details, so just the important parts to convey the messages of the growing up in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. In part because I want to make sure that we have the message of empowerment of girls' education. And, you know, as I was writing more and more, I realized that re really this is a good message uh, to encourage girls to expire higher and to go for higher education to better themselves. Um, although I'm sure that our circumstances, like in Afghanistan, is so impossible to overcome. Uh, I wish they could, and I wish I pray that things would change for the young girls. You know, like just heartbreaking for me to see them crying, coming from school, banning from, you know, being banned from going to school. So it's not a crime to go to school, but it was. It is like a crime for them to go to school. So I, I think I hope that this book will inspire people to uh, continue to dream about going for higher education. Does anyone else have questions? I have more, but I don't want to monopolize. Yeah. No. <laughs> Feel free to jump in. It looks like Dottie might have one. Hmm. Oh, yeah, was talking. We can't hear her now. Did Maybe. you have a question, Dottie? I think you need to unmute. Unmute. I think my husband has a question. Well, I was in Malaysia. Oh, great. 1965 to 67 in the Peace Corps. I was at Kapalabatas, which you probably know. It's on the it's in the Penang uh, state, but it's on the mainland. And okay. It was wonderful to look at those um, um, slides of yours. I remember India House and the USIA and um, oh, okay. <laughs> Road and Julia Street. It was just very, very oh, yes. <laughs> it All brought back trips. a lot of memories. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Those yeah. streets are amazing. Some the you know, like most co colonized places, they change the names of the street. Mm -hmm. Uh they try to get rid of the colonial history and then they change the name. But some some of the streets there are really historical in the sense that there is a section where the Jewish people moved to. And I actually don't know the history of how they moved from one place all the way to Penang. And there they they make a living, uh, living in Penang in the little enclave of uh, Jewish community. And there's also there is an in Indian row where the Indians will live. And so they set up their own tradition of uh, shops and uh, sari or whatever. So when you go to Penang, the different niches of racial group that live uh, in, on the island, and they kind of set up their little homes here and there. Mm -hmm. So in, in changing the name, sometimes you feel as though history is being erased, mm -hmm. but, uh, but such is the nature of our uh, trying to erase our other history. I think it would be nice to keep some of them or even archive some of them. Thank you. Um, can you I, I, I'm talking about Peace Corps. Actually, my sister had a Peace Corps teacher. I didn't, and I was so envious. <laughs> uh, and the Peace Corps teacher was. Uh, introducing lots of new things to them, new stuff, uh, showing them new books. And uh, so there was a lot of uh, new knowledge that mm -hmm. is outside our classroom, outside our textbooks. So I was always hoping that I somehow would get a Peace Corps as my one of my teachers, but I never did. Well, chances are I probably knew that person. <laughs> pretty much all those. Peace Corps people at that time, yeah. Yeah, it was in the 60s, yeah. Yes, I was there 65 to 67, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and, uh, and, and it was just, it's nice to have uh, in people who introduce you with new ideas and new things, and uh, rather than, you know, be very provincial, a little island. Mm -hmm. 
How um, far into your life does this book go? This book uh, goes just before I left for college. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was it, um, and ended with me getting on a plane to go to America. <laughs> <laughs> So and I, another book <laughs> met, uh, many many uh u.s ladies on the plane and one of, one of them asked me where i was going i told her that i was going to wealthy college and she told me oh you knew that it was a very prestigious this is a very prestigious college i said no <laughs> <laughs> i would love to read a chinese school pardon did you go to a Chinese school? I did. I went to a Chinese primary school and I learned lots of Mandarin uh -huh. and uh, they introduce English maybe twice a week. And then we have Malay. We got our independence. So uh -huh. the government decided that we have to learn the language Malay. So mm -hmm. there was no textbook. It was just a very, very, very fierce teacher that taught us Malay. And I think if you read the book, you'll read about Dr. Uh, Mr. Jos Yusuf, who was very mean <laughs> and uh, was trying to teach us Malay, and we didn't learn very much from him. Um, then after after primary school, I decided that I had to learn English properly. So then I wanted to just go to an English school. So secondary school was all English. Okay. Did you go through one of those bridge classes to get yeah, there? Yeah, it's called yeah. Form Remove. Yeah. yeah. So I went through a year, they just call remove class, where you spend a whole year learning English. Um, yeah. So then you can go to form one mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to be with the other regular students. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my son also went to Peace Corps. He volunteered in Sierra Leone as a Peace Corps right of the college. So he spent about almost three years in a, in a rural area in Sierra Leone as a Peace Corps teacher. It was really hard for mm -hmm. him. <laughs> um, and uh, will there be another book going from Wellesley College until the present day? <laughs> <laughs> I started writing uh, many years ago. You know, when you write memoir, you have to be careful because it, it involves other people. And so, the you know the you don't want to offend people and yet you want to tell the truth, and so when I was writing this memoir not to be published until some time when I decided that I will publish, I started uh, asking my family who mentioned in my book about the notion of them being mentioned in the book, and they uh, I had very mixed reactions. Uh, some uh, said don't ever mention me. Or I said I could change the name. And so I would say 90% of them said to me, change the name. And uh, and so I, because I was uh, fourth in a group of uh, 12 children, the younger ones, I didn't grow up with them because they were three, maybe two when I left. So I didn't grow up with them. So I didn't really... I felt sorry that I did to not include them in my book, but then their 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 react, some of their reaction was, I didn't want to be included in your book, but they were not in the book, so I felt like okay, when I included the book, <laughs> and uh, but you know it was a very strong reaction. Some people just didn't want to be mentioned. They didn't want to be. I'm not sure whether they even read my book. <laughs> uh, so. It's tough writing memoirs. So with a college thing, it might be a little bit dicey because <laughs> there are issues that I would raise that I started writing that I would raise issues that and I was growing up in the era of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So I had a period where my first year was just a lot of, oh, you're from Asia, you're Vietnam. A lot of our young men, my boyfriends would go there. So I had a lot of issues that they didn't like me because I'm from there, that I was the cause of their separation or impending separations. Wow. Well, there was issues like that. So it might be a little bit difficult to digest. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I actually tried my hand on a novel, which I finished, 
but I am trying to look for an agent for that one. Just oh. about my, I make it into a novel just because I wanted to be able to be free about writing the stories in that. And that is about the, <clears throat> the um, you know, unequal pay for women in medicine, uh, which is quite true and it's still true. Uh, so I thought it's something that I feel passionate about that I like to to go into discussion about it because many, many women would just let it go and they don't want to discuss that pay issue because they like to, not to rock the boat. They like to be able to stay home or work less so they can be home with their children. So the negotiation power is not there. Um, so they just let it go and they just, they're still earning less than the male counterparts. Mm -hmm. And it's still quite true today. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a comment from Cindy in the chat. She says, I've read and enjoyed your first two books and look forward to reading this one. I'm amazed by your bravery. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. How does your family in the U.S. react to all of your absences? Do they ever come with you? Will you do another book about your experiences in the U.S.? Oops, you already answered that. <laughs> yeah, um, no, a, a lot of my uh, going away doing humanitarian work they don't allow um, family because they don't want to be responsible for their safety. Yeah. yeah. So they just, it's, so, it's simple for them to just have you. They didn't want to be able to be responsible for the entire family unless, you know, like with the Doctors Without Borders, I have met whole family in, in, the, um, in Malawi where the whole family actually work for for MSF, wow. except the children, because the parents are there, the children come with the parents, and so the children can go to school, international school. Hmm. Uh, but you know, with other uh, organizations, they don't allow the spouses or children. My children are too busy, you know, with their lives to to do that. And my husband had no interest whatsoever to go to Africa. Africa is an unknown. A uh, scary continent for most people. So yes. my children are always worried whenever I go to uh, a, a not peaceful country. Like when I went to Libya, they were quite afraid of the bombs and everything. And uh, I would say to them that I would be more afraid to go to Somalia than Libya. <laughs> and uh, so when I went to Libya, I wasn't afraid. And uh, Somalia, I think, is a, a rogue country. It's really difficult to mm. deal with. And I went to Yemen uh, three years ago, and uh, I didn't feel uncomfortable in Yemen either. Mm. Uh, so it was during the war. They still have a war going on. Wow. Do you go with certain organizations? Yeah, with different ones, yeah. yeah. With, uh, with Yemen, it was with Med Global, which is a organization, fairly new one, set up in Chicago, and they are really into helping the Islamic country. So they are the ones that went to. They I think they have a big presence in Syria, and recently with the earthquake in Turkey, uh, they also went there to help out with uh, medical conditions in. Uh, Turkey as well as in the northern part of Syria. Wow. It's a different organization. It just happened to be if someone, you know, call you and needs you. So I would depend on my schedule. Yeah. And also depend on, on their needs. I say Ukraine, um, they only need surgeons and anesthesiologists. Uh, so they're pretty modernized. They don't need other stuff, but they need people who could do the operations. Huh, I never thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> Fields yeah. of medicine needed in different places. Yeah, but if you read the Ebola book, it took me a long while to get someone to take me there. I worked for months just trying to get there because I just couldn't in my conscience stay home when I saw so many people dying in the streets. I felt as though I could be of help, but it did not come easy. The The opening did not come easy. Hmm. Wow. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Lai? 
because she's practicing, she's practicing um, here now. Yeah. Do you still practice here? Oh, yeah. I do. Um, I cover uh, Bethesville Clinic uh, because off and on they'll call me. Uh, I used to do urgent care, but they closed the urgent care clinic. I think because of the pandemic and stuff like that, it was hard to screen people. But the last six months or so, I had been uh, called to cover a uh, shortage of people in some of the clinics. So they had asked me to kind of fill in a day or two, but I, I mean, I, I do out of kindness in my heart, <laughs> but I, I really don't need the, uh, the uh, financial stuff, but I just felt like, because they were really in need of somebody to, to take care of the patients, I would help out. But since I came back, I haven't really reached out. <laughs> I just felt like uh, my uh, my uh, Everest base camp track um, where I walked 90 miles in 12 days <laughs> <laughs> took a lot out of me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, we should say again that um, the, there are copies of the book available everywhere, but also at the Silver Unicorn Bookstore yeah. in Acton. They were going to come sell here tonight, but that didn't work out. So if you get a yeah. chance to check out that store, it's really yeah. great. Shop. We support them. Yeah. yeah. And I would. I hope that if you read my any of my books, you would try to leave a review in your favorite site, Goodreads, Amazon, or Bookbubs, whatever. It will be helpful for the other readers. Thank you so much for spending your evening with me. Thank you again for sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Namaste, as I learned from Nepal. Come see our loop. All right. Take care, guys. Have a good night. Bye.